ki ora koto, na mihi nui ki na tangata fenoa o tene rohe. Ko Tara Robertson aho, no Vancouver aho, tena koto katoa. Oh. Thank you, Courtney Johnson, for giving me that mihi, and my friend Georgie Ferrari, who recorded on her iPhone, and my partner, Carolyn Arthur, who listened to me do it over and over and over again. <laughs> I'm so excited um, to be here. Um, I'm from Canada, I arrived from Canada about 10 days ago, and this whole trip has been full of wonderful, serendipitous connections. Um, it's been amazing to connect with old friends and colleagues, and I appreciate the hospitality that Fiona and the rest of the NDF organizing committee has shown us. Thank you. We feel really welcome and taken care of. So finding the right title is something I'm not very good at. So I'm mostly going to talk about my diversity and inclusion, aka DNI work, at Mozilla, but I'm going to take some detours and blah, blah, blah. So I'm one of those annoying extroverts who not only practices a mihi on an iPhone over and over again, but I like to think out loud. And I appreciate the generosity that all of these people have extended me. These people are friends, colleagues, comrades, librarians, sex worker activists, academics, feminists, queers, and artists. I want to acknowledge and thank all of these people up front as an extended citation, feminist citation process. I'm standing on the shoulders of these giants. So um, here's a bit.ly link to the articles I'm going to reference in this talk. Let you look. bit.ly slash Tara hyphen NDF. So I was born in Vancouver and grew up in a logging town called Prince George. Prince George is 800 kilometers north of Vancouver at the junction of the Nechaco and Fraser Rivers. It's on the traditional territory of the Lightly Ten, which means the people of where the two rivers flow together. Growing up, most towns in a 10-hour radius didn't have any McDonald's, and my town, population 75,000, had four. This is Mr. PG, the town mascot. Eight meters tall, originally made of wood, he rotted, and the replacement is built to last out of fiberglass and sheet metal. I feel like this really represents who I am and where I'm from. <laughs> my mom is Japanese Canadian and my dad is white of Scottish and Irish ancestry. I've lived in seven different countries, including Scotland and Japan, partly to learn about the world, but I think I was learning, looking for a sense of belonging and a place to call home. Being mixed race and queer means I don't fit in a lot of situations, but it's also given me a first-hand personal view of group dynamics. I see things that a lot of people in the majority groups do not. In 2009, I moved here with the intent to spend a year in Wellington. I'm grateful that Courtney Johnson hired me on contract to work on the National Library's website. To be honest, I was a bit crap. I was trying to figure out a couple of things in my life, and I wasn't the greatest employee. I made some colossal errors, including taking down the website three times, <laughs> which has given me great stories to tell during job interviews when they ask, can you tell us about a time when you've had failure? <laughs> so I planned to stay here for a year, but I got homesick during the cold, wet Wellington winter. And I guess the silver lining for me of feeling homesick is that I realized where home was. This is my home. Vancouver's been my home for 15 years now. The Pacific Ocean and the mountains feel like a giant hug. Old friendships and community connections root me in this place. Google Maps says it takes about 17 hours to fly from here from there. Before Mozilla, I was a librarian for 12 years, mostly working in post-secondary institutions. I was drawn to libraries because I care deeply about access to information. People often ask me about my odd career path from libraries to doing diversity and inclusion in the tech sector. And I was active in library technology communities where I led some of the work to make our conferences safer and more inclusive. For the last five years of my librarian career, I managed an accessibility organization that serves students with print disabilities, 
by format shifting their textbooks into digital formats that they could use. I'm still very passionate about accessibility and universal design. I love that NDF organizers care about accessibility and communication access. The interpreter Tanya and I also know each other from 16 years ago when we both lived in Hokkaido in Japan. It feels really special to have her interpreting my words into NZ sign language. So I've been at Mozilla for over a year, and... Sorry, I did a little bit of this. Sorry. So I've been at Mozilla for just over a year, and as the diversity and inclusion strategic partner, I'm the data person on our team. I've been building out our infrastructure so we can measure progress on diversity metrics. I partner with different parts of the organization on specific strategies for cultural inclusion, and I've led projects on trans inclusion and continue to advocate for accessibility. So Mozilla, what's Mozilla? Um, we have 1,200 staff and 10,000 community volunteers worldwide. Our mission is to ensure that the internet is a global public resource, open and accessible to all. And the way we do this is through open source products like Firefox, the web browser. And if you're not using Firefox, I suggest you give it a try because we relaunched Firefox Quantum last fall. It's fast and we don't do bad things with your data. So it's kind of a, an, an interesting structure because Mozilla is a company with one shareholder, a nonprofit foundation, the Mozilla Foundation. They do a lot of awesome work on policy, they publish the Internet Health Report. They host MozFest in London. And the main thing they do is offer fellowships to 26 technologists, activists, and scientists in more than 10 countries, including New Zealand. This year, our fellows include a neuroscient neuroscientist who's building open source laboratory hardware, an artist and maker who's looking to make weird projects that can only really live on the decentralized web and make tools and tutorials to help other people make even better, weirder things. And Sam Muirhead, here in Wellington. Sam is working on an open source approach to the creation and adaptation of illustration, comics, and animation. The aim is to support international activist networks using digital campaigns in diverse cultural contexts enabling local chapters to speak with their own creative voice while building solidarity and sharing resources across the network. I got to meet this cohort of fellows in Toronto, and it's one of the most amazing groups of people I've ever met. I'm so excited about the change that they're making in this world. So these are two questions that I've guided my work for the last 10 years. In most social situations, I think it's interesting to observe who's here in the room. Who's at the table? Who speaks a lot? Who has social capital? Who feels welcome? And whose ideas are centered and respected by default? I think it's actually even more interesting to note who's missing? Who's not even in the room? Who's just sitting on the margins? Who doesn't feel welcome? And who has to fight to have their voice heard and respected? So for groups that value innovation and new ideas, diversity is key. There's plenty of social science research out there that demonstrate this, but one of my favorite articles is by Dr. Catherine Phillips. She's the professor of leadership and ethics and senior vice dean at Columbia Business School. Her article titled, How Diversity Makes Us Smarter in Scientific American is an accessible summary of the key research in this area. Dr. Phillips says, when we're around people like us, whether it's people who are the same race, gender, or have the same political viewpoints as us, it leads us to think that we all hold the same viewpoints and share the same information and perspectives. When we hear dissent from someone who is different from us, it provokes more thought than when it comes from someone who looks just like us. Diversity jolts us into cognitive action in ways that homogeneity does not. Simply by being in the presence of someone who is not like you, you will be more diligent and more open-minded. You will work harder on explaining your rationale and anticipating alternatives than you would have otherwise. Like, amazing. So there's a couple of other important points to note um, from Dr. Phillips' article. 
While diverse groups performed better than homogeneous groups, they also had more conflict and enjoyed working together less. So as someone who works in DNI, this means that as we build more diverse teams, we also need to build people's skills on understanding unconscious bias, giving and receiving feedback, and communicating when there's conflict. So Mozilla's mission is to ensure the internet is a global public resource, open and accessible to all. But how do we do that if we don't have everyone at the table helping us build these products? It's not just about diversity, but people need to feel they can bring their whole selves to the table and that difference will be accepted and valued. This is the inclusion piece. So when Michael did this this morning, I was like, oh, he stole my idea. So I'm going to give you a minute to think about a situation where someone has done something to make you feel included. Um, I want you to write it down on a piece of paper or on your phone or whatever. Um, could be an example from school, work, church group, sports team, whatever. So you got a minute. Okay, um, if you can get into groups of two now and share what you wrote down. You've got two minutes, go! <laughs> I know I'm the person between you and drinks, so. Um, so I'm gonna change the question a little bit. Um, I'm just blown away by the atmosphere here. There's something really, really special about this conference. Um, it's super welcoming and super inclusive. Um, I don't know why it is, but it's, not all conferences are like this. You've got something really special here. So in groups of four now, I want you to think about what you can do to make this community even more inclusive. So take your pair and partner up with another pair. You've got four minutes. And I want you to add your ideas to this um, Google Doc. And can you bring it up? More exercises like these, get people talking to each other. Check the room, who is not talking? Hmm. Introduce people to each other more. I love the idea, where was it? Go out to the community and invite community groups to shoulder tap individuals for scholarships, paid attendance to the conference. So many great ideas. Um, thank you. Can we go back to the slides, please? Think. So at the start of our DNI journey at Mozilla, we did 20 focus groups with Mozillians. We heard ab about many diversity dimensions in our findings, and they've shaped the way that we define diversity. So diversity is the mix of things that makes us who we are. It's our specific, unique, beautiful mix of people. In the top right-hand corner, there's MoFo and MoCo. MoCo is our internal shorthand for the Mozilla Corporation, and internally we call people who work for the foundation MoFos. <laughs> so then what's inclusion? We Mozillians believe that inclusion is getting our specific mix of people to work well together to invite voices forward, to speak boldly but respectfully, and to listen intently. Inclusion is about how each one of us wants to be treated. This is a quote from Mitchell Baker, our chairwoman. Mozilla's mission is to build the internet as a global public resource, open and accessible to all. Open and accessible to all implies a deep commitment to inclusion and to building inclusive practices. As part of this commitment, we describe a set of behaviors of inclusion that we aspire to. These are set out in our Mozilla Community Participation Guidelines. So our CPG is the code of conduct at Mozilla. It outlines both behaviors that we want to see and behaviors that are unacceptable. So the following behaviors are expected of all Mozillians. 
Be respectful. Value each, other, each other's ideas, styles, and viewpoints. We may not always agree, but disagreement is no excuse for poor manners. Be open to different possibilities and to being wrong. Be kind in all interactions and communications, especially when debating the merits of different opinion options. Sorry. Be aware of your impact and how intense interactions can be affecting people. Be direct, constructive, and positive. Take responsibility for your impact and your mistakes. If someone says they've been harmed through your words or actions, listen carefully, apologize sincerely, and correct the behavior going forward. Be direct but professional. We are likely to have some discussions about if and when criticism is respectful and when it's not. We must be able to speak directly when we disagree and when we think things need to improve. We cannot withhold hard truths. Doing so respectfully is hard. Doing so when others don't seem to be listening is harder. And hearing such comments when one is the recipient can be harder still. We need to be honest and direct as well as respectful. So I love that this is written in plain English. Um, and recently I found myself dragging my feet on having a hard conversation with someone I care about who I work with. And so when I was practicing for this talk, I could hear myself saying, we cannot withhold hard truths. We need to be honest and direct as well as respectful. And I was like, oh, that was the nudge that I needed to have this conversation. And looking back, I wish I'd had it about four weeks before. So the CPG also outlines behaviors that are not tolerated. These include violence, threats of violence, personal attacks, derogatory language, disruptive behavior, like heckling speakers, and unwelcome sexual attention or physical contact. So this is a quote from the CPG. This includes touching a person without permission, including sensitive areas such as their hair, pregnant stomach, mobility device, like a wheelchair, a scooter, or tattoos. This also includes physically blocking or intimidating another person. Physical contact or simulated physical contact, such as the emoji kiss, and without, without for affirmative consent is not acceptable. So I love that there's lots of practical examples here, and I think a lot about these things, and some of them were new for me. The CPG also includes information about the consequences of unacceptable behaviors and information on how to report. It's open licensed under a CC attribution share-alike license, which maybe people do or do not understand. Um, I think all the work that we do has ripple effects in the world. So Mazilians in Brazil used our CPG as the basis for an open letter when they were calling out a transphobic incident at a JavaScript conference. And a couple of weeks ago, the SQL Light community adopted our code of conduct, or our CPG is their code of conduct. In an article in Wired titled, Diversity in Open Source is Even Worse Than in Tech Overall, Clint Finley writes, even though the users of open source software present in countless products and services are now as diverse as the internet itself, the open source development community remains startlingly white and male, even by tech industry's dismal standards. So I had a lot of imposter syndrome throughout my application process at Mozilla. I was thinking like, I'm a librarian in Canada working at a community college that no one's heard of. Why, why would they want to hire me? And there were three sentences in the job ad that convinced me to apply. They were, you demonstrate a history of working in a collaborative and open manner, whether that be an open source project or simply openly discussing proje projects and questions. You should apply even though you don't feel your credentials are a 100% match with the position description. And we're looking for relevant skills and experience, not a checklist that matches the position and description itself. Of course, this is by design. Knowing that open source skews white and male, requiring open source experience that would limit who would choose to apply, and likely some excellent candidates would self-select out. The key experience, that open collaboration, is listed, but not open source experience itself. We also use a tool called Textio to make sure our job postings use balanced language. Thankfully, we don't post job ads for code ninjas, or rock star developers anymore. 
So in the 1970s, top orchestras in the US were only about 5% women. At the time, there were lots of reasons given for this, including women have smaller techniques than men, women are more temperamental and more likely to demand special attention or treatment, and that the more women, the poorer the sound. Zubin Mehta, conductor of the LA Symphony from 1964 to 78, and of the New York Philharmonic from 1978 to 1990 is credited with saying, I just don't think women should be in an orchestra. So by 2000, orchestras were up to almost 30% women. What changed? So part of the change was the introduction of a, the blind audition, where musicians literally auditioned behind a curtain. So the panel couldn't see what they looked like, if they were a man or a woman, or what race they were. They could just evaluate them based on what they sounded like. And they found even with the curtain, they needed to do some further debiasing. Women's high heels went click clack on the, the stage. So they either put out a rug or had, had the women take their high heels off and had men go clump, 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 clump. <laughs> so there were no telltale noises. Now, most US orchestras are about 40 to 50% women. Though there are very few women in who are conductors or in the brass section. In my research, I found that they called it the brass ceiling. <laughs> so at Mozilla, our version of the blind audition is a tool called HackerRank. This enable, enables hiring managers to evaluate candidates based on the quality of their code. Not their name, not their perceived gender or race, or the university that they graduated from. We started using HackerRank to select candidates for our university internships. There were, there were more than four times the improvement in the first two years of HackerRank. So we went from having two women to 13, and we went from seven colleges, which were the, the predictable MIT, blah, 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 to 27 colleges and a code academy. And 71% of the cohort in 2017 were women or people of color. So it worked for us too. I've been involved in open source projects for 10 years now. And when I first got involved, I really bought into the idea of a meritocracy, which means those with merit rise to the top. Merit is based on your contributions, talent, and achievements, not on your job title, the company you work for, or the university you graduated from. I now see that meritocracy has a ton of bias baked into it. We come from different privilege, access to resources, tools, and technology. It's not a level playing field. So last month, Mozilla stopped using meritocracy as a way to describe our governance and leadership structures. This was a big deal. Emma Irwin, our DNI community lead, writes, from the beginning of this journey to a more inclusive organization, We've been thinking about the words we use as important carriers of our intended culture and the culture we wish to see in the broader movements we participate in. Another big thing that happened this year is we did our first ever external diversity disclosure. So this is voluntary and we've joined about 30 other tech companies publishing high level demographic data. At the end of 2017, Women made up 24% of Mozilla overall, 33% in leadership, and 13% in tech roles. Underrepresented minorities in the US, um, which is defined as being black, Latinx, or indigenous folks, made up 7% of Mozilla staff overall in the US, 0% in leadership, and 6% in tech roles. Our CEO, Chris Beard, said, we're not where we want to be, and we have a lot more work to do. And I really appreciate this intellectual honesty and transparency. I'm excited for us to have our 2018 numbers so that we can share the progress we've made. So librarianship also is startlingly white. Uh, we know that librarianship is a female-dominated profession, but there's not much data about the racial makeup of librarians in Canada, New Zealand, and the US. In Canada, there was only one study done by the Canadian Association of Professional Academic Librarians. 
of, well, not surprisingly, academic librarians. They collected over 1,700 names and email addresses by looking at college and university websites and sent out their survey. About 900 people replied, and 91% of the respondents were white. Only 2% of the respondents identified as indigenous. And in Canada, that's First Nations, Métis, or Inuit. So being in a community of librarians, I'm often a lazy researcher. I'll do a quick search for something and then reach out to some, someone who's more expert in the topic than me. When Fiona asked if I had any questions about the New Zealand context, I asked her my data question. And she, in turn, used the same methodology. <laughs> I reached out to Lianza, Te Ropu, Fakaho, and RNANZ. And no one was aware of any demographic research that had been done in this area. According to Amer the American Library Association's Diversity Counts report in 2009 10, and 10, 88% of credentialed librarians in the US are white. And thanks to Barbara Chawner, who pointed me to this report. One more study. According to Elise, the Library and, Library and Information Science Education Statistical Report in 2015, 79% of students at ALA-accredited universities in the U.S. are white. This means that the pipeline for future librarians is only slightly more diverse than the workforce. This isn't good enough. The sparse or non-existent data tells a story by what's missing. We measure things that we care about, and I hope that our library associations and researchers will take this on. We need to know what our baseline is, and we need to be able to track change over time. So I was thinking, like, and I think this is the most controversial thing I'm going to say in this talk. Looking at the lack of racial diversity in librarianship and looking at um, how undiverse the library school pipeline is, and if we think that diversity is important, and go back to the arguments around innovation, we, this is something we need to do to survive and be relevant. Um, I think there's also additional arguments about reflecting the diversity of our user groups in society, and also it's the right thing to do. Um, seeing the lack of racial diversity in this library school student data, which is our pipeline, I think we really need to question if the MLIS or MLS should be a requirement for all librarian jobs. I think we need to articulate our core competencies for what is important in libraries now and broaden our view of whose qualifications are relevant. We need to recruit from a more diverse pool of candidates. And when I mention this, people often say, oh, we're going to be lowering the bar. And it's not lowering the bar, actually. Rather, I think being more critical about what libraries need will actually raise the bar. And we need to stop talking about cultural fit when we're hiring people. Cultural fit is a shorthand that says um, those that candidate is just like us, which perpetuates a monoculture of people who look like us and think like us. And that's not what we need. So in addition to rethinking our hiring pool, we need to build an additional scaffolding so that people of color can imagine a future for themselves in libraries. We need extra mentorship, and the promotion path needs to leadership needs to be clear. And as diversity and inclusion are intertwined, we need to work to change the culture of libraries so that people of color can bring their full selves to work. And those differences will be valued. I think this will mean some hard and necessary conversations about our culture and whiteness. So I'm going to shift gears and talk about consent now. Code for Lib is a library technology conference and community where I felt really at home. In 2015, I proposed that we ask speakers for permission to live stream their talks and use colored lanyards as a visual shorthand to communicate people's desire to be in photos online. It's kind of like the stoplight. Red meant absolutely no photos, yellow meant ask first, and green meant everything's okay. And some of the initial comments that I got from men who had been in the community longer than me really bummed me out. They included, this needs to be opt out, not opt in. I enjoy taking candid photos of people at the conference, and no one seems to mind. And 
My old hippie soul cringes at unnecessary paperwork. A consent form means nothing. Situations change. Even a well-intended agreement sometimes needs to be reneged on. Hmm. So I was able to get enough support to get this off the ground. Another woman of color, Ranti Junis, helped me put together a consent form, and we did the work of talking to all the speakers. The conference organizers ordered different colored lanyards last minute, and this just became part of how we do things at Code for Lib, and many other conferences have followed suit. So consent is something that's really important to me as a feminist, and I want to take a quick detour here and blah, 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 and share a personal story. In spring of 2016, I came out in my professional life as a former sex worker. I know what it's like to have content about myself online that I didn't consent to. In my case, it was a newspaper article that appeared in a major Canadian newspaper that identifies me as a sex worker and a librarian. For most of my career, I was terrified that my employer or my colleagues would find this out. We live in a judgmental society where there are many negative stereotypes about sex workers, and I was worried that this would undermine my professional reputation. I think we would all agree that open access to information is a good thing. And if you remember, that's one of the reasons I became a librarian. And over the last couple of years, I've come to realize that this isn't an absolute. And there's times where it's not appropriate or not ethical for information to be accessible for all. In 2006, or 2016, I learned that Reveal Digital, a nonprofit that worked with libraries and is now defunct, digitized On Our Backs, a lesbian porn magazine that ran from 1984 to 2004. For a brief moment, I was really excited. Porn that was nostalgic for me was gonna be available online. And then I quickly realized that friends who appeared in the magazine before the internet even existed that this could harm their personal or professional lives. There are ethical issues with digitizing collections like this. Consenting to a porn shoot that would be in a queer magazine with a limited print run is a different thing to consenting to have your porn shoot be available online on the internet. So for a year, I kept digging and researching this topic. I visited Cornell, Cornell's, Cornell University's rare book and manuscripts collection and found the contributor contracts. I learned a lot more about US copyright law, and most importantly, I talked to queer women who modeled for On Our Backs about their thoughts and feelings about this. I guess I should explain the image. So the, the red umbrella is a symbol that sex worker activists use in public to represent the community. At the Open Education Conference, the conference swag were red umbrellas, and I took the organizers aside and I said, did you know this? And they said, no, we didn't. So <laughs> it's interesting. So I mentioned the models. Here's a quote from one of the models um, in, an e in an email to me. I'll just give you a moment to read it. She writes, people can cut up my body and make a collage. My professional life can be hijacked. These are uses I never intended and still don't want. So I was successful in getting this collection taken down from Reveal Digital's collection by publicly questioning their ethics and questioning the ethics of digitization projects like this and amplifying the voices of these women who were in on our backs. And I think there's lots of other non-porn examples of culturally sensitive materials that should not be wholly digitized and made available through open access. So when I was researching this topic, Stuart Yates pointed me to the NZ Electronic Text Center's community consultation and report on digitizing the book Moko, or Maori Tattooing, that was published in 1896. And I think that report was really interesting for me to read just how much conversation there was with the community, but also that there were five different access options given. It wasn't an all or nothing. Okay, so back to lanyards. <laughs> when I came to Mozilla, I was delighted to see that we had a way to opt out of photos, even during work events. Here's a bit from a blog post from Brianna Mark, our senior event planner. 
She says, like many people who use Firefox, our employees be, value being able to choose with clarity and confidence which information they share and with whom. One of the ways that we look out for this when hosting our all hands events is by offering our attendees the choice of a white or red lanyard. White lanyards mean you're okay being photographed, a red one means you're not. Wearing a name badge is required at our events, so a colored lanyard is a very visible way to communicate a preference without ever having to say a word. It also makes it really easy to spot and remove photographs that have been taken by mistake. Like with our work, Mozilla's values don't necessarily tell us what to do, but remind us rather how we should do it. Making red lanyards available to our employees and their families as part of a semi-annual event is a small but tangible manifestation of just what we mean. And I love how we keep iterating on our culture. At last year's, at our last All Hands that was in San Francisco, Brianna added these pronoun stickers at the registration desk that people could choose to put on their name tag. I like that this is something that we can do to make our culture more inclusive. And this is another example of the work, how, how the work we do creates ripples in the world. A, un, a labor union organizer saw this photo on social media and adopted it for their conference. So I've mentioned all hands a couple of times now. It's our twice yearly meeting where we all come together in person. Mozilla staff are in 16 countries and 40% of our workforce work remotely, so not in any office. All hands is a critical part of building the connective tissue that allows us to work well together the rest of the year. The week that I get home, the week after I get home to Canada, I'm home for five days, and then I turn around and go to Orlando for our next All Hands. And as I mentioned, this past All Hands was in San Francisco in the summer. And the big event is the plenary, where our senior executives talk about where we're at and where we're going. So imagine 1,200 of us in this giant hotel ballroom. So in between each of the executive presentations, regular staff were interested first reading short thank you emails from our users and other short snippets. This was the short snippet between the chief marketing officer and the chief people officer. Hi, my name is Lauren Nylett. I work on lifecycle marketing out of my home in North Carolina. I recently sent a letter to Yasha, we just met, and uh, I'm going to share it with all of you now. Yasha, you might recall a conversation we briefly had at Austin All Hands about some, some interesting <clears throat> changes in my life. But just to put a label on it, I'm transitioning my gender presentation to female. This has been a lifelong time coming. <laughs> Thank you. This has been a lifelong time coming. While I wouldn't say changing genders is anything close to the easiest thing I've ever done, this ongoing process has already been one of the best. I've been asking colleagues, one or two at a time, to start calling me Lauren and referring to me with feminine pronouns. And I'd like for you to do the same. Don't worry about slip-ups. I forget at least once a day, and it's my name. <laughs> Like any self-respecting marketer, I'm working with HR on a go-to-market strategy to take this news big. <laughs> that is, uh, by the way, highfalutin talk for an email to all of marketing. <laughs> but I'm writing to give you an early heads up. I do want to mention that your personal and professional commitment to making Mozilla Marketing a safe space that values all people was a huge factor in my decision to begin transition. As a member of the group that worked on team norms, I'm very aware that things here weren't perfect. But I also know that after I began living authentically, I would feel respected and protected at Mozilla. And the work I do would be more important than my pronouns. You should know 
how much of an incredible impact your commitment to these values can have on one individual life. Thank you just doesn't seem to capture it. Thank you. So Lauren is amazing. Um, I think it took a ton of courage for her to stand in front of the whole company and read the email that she sent to the chief marketing officer announcing her new pronoun and her name. Um, I love how she said, you, you know, I was part of the group that worked on team norms and I'm aware that things weren't perfect here, but knowing your personal and professional commitment to inclusion, I knew that once I had come out, I would be respected and my work would be respected here. Um, so for me, there, I had so many emotions when this was happening. Um, when people cheered, what you don't feel is the feeling in the room. Everyone leaned forward with a lot of care and was listening, everyone was listening very carefully, but like there was something in the air where people were like, oh wow, this, this is something that's really important and something that we care deeply about. Also, to have the courage that Lauren had to, one, speak in front of 1,200 people, but to, to share such a personal thing, um, it's just amazing. Um, I was moved to tears, and I wasn't the only one in the audience. So uh, I wrote some guidelines to support staff who are transitioning their gender at work. And initially, I intended it to be a simple list of places that one would need to update their username and gender marker but there was a lot of scope creep and it became a more comprehensive document to give context to people who hadn't really thought about gender and gender identity and gender expression. Um, it gave managers um, an understanding of what their responsibilities were and it was a resource for all staff to understand how they can make Mozilla a more welcoming and inclusive place. So I heard from managers that they wanted to do the right thing and that they were worried that they might make a mistake and hurt someone. So I organized some training to help our staff level up their knowledge and comf comfort in being inclusive of trans and non-binary colleagues. 180 people RSVP to attend the sessions, which is more than 15%. And to date, which a couple weeks ago, the recordings have been viewed 300 times. Mozillians really care, and they want to do better. So as of yesterday morning, I didn't have an ending to this talk, and I was starting to get a little bit worried. Um, Fiona organized two tours for us at the National Library, and Michael Edson had a question about Maori worldviews. And just then, Bella, a Maori elder, was walking by. She was so generous with her time and explained some things about her culture. And one of the things that she said really stuck in my head and my heart. And I realized it was the thread that was woven through this talk. And she said, you know, what is the most important thing in the world? And it's the people. And it's the people. And it's the people. Hey, Tangata. Hey, Tangata. Hey, Tangata. And I'm surprised to be so emotional right now, but there's so many amazing people in this room doing such amazing and important cultural heritage work with such love and such care. Um, feels to be such an honor to be here speaking with you today. Thank you.